Please join me in welcoming Cassie Kozirkov, the influential founder and CEO of Data Scientific and the pioneering first decision scientist at Google. A trailblazer in the field, Cassie has been instrumental in shaping the domain of decision intelligence. Her work includes designing Google's analytics program, training over 20,000 Googlers in statistics, decision making, and machine learning. Today, she leads Data Scientific, an elite agency known for assisting global leaders and executives in optimizing critical decisions. So, Casey, may I ask you, whose job does AI automate? Thank you for that introduction. And uh, yes, I have the answer, but... Uh... But we'll get there in a sort of meandering way. Uh, good morning, Belgrade. I am so happy to be here with you today. And I have a quick question for the audience. Who here identifies themselves as an AI professional? Show of hands, show of hands. Okay, I see some hands. How about who does not identify as an AI professional? All right, a little more hands, a little more hands. Uh, friends among the AI professionals, do you know what year was the first year that the term artificial intelligence was used? Anybody? We're going to have to do a little history here, I think. The answer is 1955-ish, 1956, for sure, because in 1955 there was a fun grant proposal being made. And in this grant proposal was the first time that this term was used. So I think that was written in 1955, but it was for a summer workshop in 1956. So what was the grant proposal for? It was for a summer school session at Dartmouth in America. Uh, that's a, a university and a bunch of postdocs led by uh, an, or postdocs or assistant professors, I forget what they were at the time, uh, led by a fellow at MIT, John McCarthy. Uh, they wanted to get the funding to get together 10 of them to spend two months working on what they called, in this grant proposal, artificial intelligence. Now, there are two fun facts about this situation, which you might enjoy. The first fun fact, and I actually only learned this myself in October, from someone who used to work directly with one of those 10 attendees. The first fun fact is, why that term? Is it because it is truly intelligent, because we do get a lot of questions like, are these things intelligent? That name is a curse that comes from the grant proposal, where it turns out that John McCarthy wrote that term in order to scare the US government into giving funding. So that term was picked not because anybody particularly knew what intelligence was or how the human brain worked, but rather because that term sounded intimidating. And we're still living with some of the legacy and baggage of that. Sometimes it uh, stops organizations from being sensible in what to expect. The other fun fact about the name artificial intelligence is that in that grant proposal where it was first used, the writers of the proposal were planning to solve all of artificial intelligence with 10 people in two months in 1956. So there's a legacy in this field of big talk, which does not necessarily meet reality. So maybe we should level set a little bit and uh, reorient ourselves. Maybe what we should have called it, if we wanted AI as an acronym, is automated inspiration. Maybe that would have been a better term. Or amplified impact, which we're seeing a lot today. Or this year's move towards augmented individuals. But really, this is a story of automation. So let's see automation at its most basic. So what are we doing with a computer? We're automating digitally. We're turning inputs into outputs. How, how? via a recipe. So what's a recipe? It's some code. It's a model. Those are all fancy words for recipe. 
takes the inputs, turns them into outputs. But we're going to need some hardware here to do it. The recipe is not enough. We're going to need a computer. And you are probably imagining this kind of computer. But I want to show you a different kind of computer that's also a computer. Meet Dora. And Dora is a computer. Now, how do I know this? Because Dora happens to be my friend's wife's aunt. And Dora was actually a computer. Here is her marriage certificate from 1950. And you can see very clearly there that her profession is listed as computer. So she is a real computer. So we're going to have her in this example. And what she's supposed to do is take an input and turn it into an output via some recipe. Now, how does she know what to do? Right? Those of you who already work with computers, those of you who are developers, you know that a computer needs something very important, which is an engineer to program the computer, right? And luckily, Dora has an engineer also, because there you can see her husband's profession is listed as engineer. So this is one of those early days in history where a computer has managed to marry her engineer. Now, let's consider Dora and her engineer husband. Back then, in 1950, we want to get Dora to do a task like recognize whether an image has a cat in it or not. This was a very classic computer vision task, right? The cat, not cat task. Now, one way in which we could do this is to figure out the exact instructions to give Dora of what to do with the input. Now, consider what the input is. The input is a bunch of pixel color values. So it's a bunch of pixels. And the question is, what should you do with each pixel in an image to get the answer cat, not cat? Right? What is that recipe supposed to be? And now you're thinking philosophical things, like what makes a cat a cat? Difficult question, right? Like, what do you do with the top left-hand pixel and the one next to it? And what are you looking for in the image? Are you looking for triangles, maybe two triangles, maybe some ovals for eyes? This is a hard recipe to come up with. And so in order to program a computer with instructions, do this, then do that, then do that, first, you have to know how to do the task, which, you know, how are you actually doing the task, though? You're doing it. Your brain is doing it. But what are you actually doing with the pixels? That is so hard to put into words. You don't even know what you're doing. So how on earth are you going to program with the instructions of what to look for in each pixel? Very difficult. Now, there's a different way that we could go about this. Instead of explaining what to do with each pixel, you could instead explain your wishes with examples. Here are a bunch of examples of cat. Here are a bunch of examples of not cat. You go find the patterns and then make a recipe automatically from those patterns so that you can take yourself from input to output. This examples versus instructions thing. This is the essence of the difference between machine learning slash AI and traditional programming. And notice that we already do this with one another as humans. Sometimes we explain our wishes with examples. Sometimes we explain our wishes with instructions. So we already teach one another one of these two ways. Now we are able to do the same thing with machines, except we need fancy words for examples and instructions. So we've got code is instructions and examples map to data. So this really is the difference between the traditional software programming approach and the AI slash machine learning programming approach. So let's make sure that we warm up this room and look at doing this cat, not cat task together. So I give you a bunch of inputs with their appropriate labels. And then something in your brain figures out what those patterns are, turns that into a recipe. And then when the next one comes in, you're going to take it and you're going to convert it to the output I'm looking for. So to wake ourselves up, we're going to play this game together. I need each and every one of you to shout cat or not cat when I show you an input. Do you think you can do it? Yes? yes. You're not loud enough for me. Yes? Yes. 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 OK, good. Right. So here comes the first one. Yes. Cat. 
Someone said yes. Uh, excellent. Working as intended. So, Cat, I agree with you, Cat. See, computers also make mistakes. This is, this is what, what we will see as a theme here. Right, this one, I agree with you. Cat, next. Not Cat. Not Cat. Cat. <laughs> what do I hear you saying? Big cat? Maybe cat? These aren't allowable options. We agreed. It was either cat or not cat. So what is this big cat, maybe cat? And you can't seem to agree which one it is. Huh. Troubling, most troubling. We begin to see what the leader and decision maker might be for in this situation. This isn't one platonic right answer. This isn't objective at all. The right answer here depends very much on the purpose of the system. What does it exist for? And so I guess I'd better fill those big boots and I will tell you that this is supposed to be a pet recommendation system. And so if it classifies something as a cat, that had better be from the feline family and in its typical adult form, safe to cuddle. Right, let's try this again. Not cat, and if you're still saying cat, please take out more life insurance. <laughs> right? I've seen some of those YouTube videos. Those, uh, those YouTube videos with the, uh, the three tigers jumping into the back of the car, those are not a good idea. Uh, this is not a pet, and let's not classify it as a cat. Now, there are different applications and different situations in which you might actually want to classify that image as a cat. It depends very much on what the system is for. Which brings me to our big topic, which is data. What we are doing here is we are automating our wishes using examples, using data. And we've all gone a little bit mad when it comes to data. We pronounce it like it has a, a capital D in it. And we become so much more humble if we just say what this is, which is examples written down in electronic form. Textbooks, essentially for the machine student to learn from. And data quality is everything. If you're going to teach someone with examples, the quality of those examples matters so much. And none of this is purely objective, same uh, meaning and answer every time. As you can see, depending on the purpose of the system, whether the right answer is cat or not cat changes. So data is a bunch of scraps of information that we happen to write down, that we put in a textbook for a machine to learn from. Like human textbooks, normal textbooks for human students, machine textbooks, data sets, have human authors. They don't arrive from aliens. They don't come from nowhere, from, you know, from the universe. They are collected by us and they fit the sensibilities of whoever is in charge of the data process. And the trouble with them, of course, is that they reflect unconscious things we might not even have considered could be a problem when we were authoring our textbooks. So when you think about really old textbooks, and you think whether you would want to teach your children from these really old textbooks from 200 years ago, 300 years ago, you're thinking absolutely not. It doesn't matter what the title on the, the cover of that textbook is. Chances are, if you try to learn from it, you're going to pick up some habits that are not good or useful habits. So thinking about the quality of your textbook, it's really, really important. And can you complete the following sentence just to make sure that we're all on the same page? Garbage in, garbage out. You know this. So what I find very interesting about the data space, the data professions, data science, I find fascinating about data science. So when you go to a data conference or a data science conference, so sometimes I hang out with people. I'll hang out with people after this as well if you want to hang out out there. And sometimes folks come, they hang out, and they've got all different job roles, so I'll ask them. 
you know, what do you do professionally? One will say statistician, and that one will be data engineer, and that one will be clinical researcher, and so on. And then I like to do another round. And I like to ask them, okay, who in your organization is responsible for data quality? Who, who's in charge of it from data design, documentation, the cleanup, all the way through to the um, part where it starts hitting the pipelines that the data engineers have built. So who shapes the data set? And what I love to hear here is that as we go around, we have a very high correlation with whatever they said their own job title was. So the statistician says statisticians are responsible for it. The researchers say researchers are responsible for it. Data engineers say data engineers are responsible for it. You know what that sounds like? That sounds like a situation where it's everybody's job and therefore nobody's job. In order to automate with data, you need good and appropriate data. In order to get good and appropriate data, you need an expertise in a bunch of different topics. You don't need to be a full expert in statistics, for example, but you need some expertise in statistics. You need some understanding of data engineering, some understanding of survey design, human psychology if the data sets are about humans. You need some uh, user experience design if you are gathering that information online and how is the the way that you are presenting the questions influencing the answers that you get back. There's a lot of expertise you need. And yet, where is the job role for this? Where is the profession that takes this seriously? And I had a really terrible aha moment with this. I was hanging out with a data science influencer, as one does, and um, I was talking about how this is a problem, that we are building our disciplines on a foundation of data, and yet the quality of that data is no one's job. I was saying, this is so important. Maybe instead of over-focusing on this last mile thing, maybe we should put more effort as a profession, as an industry, in the, the first bit, the actual data quality. I was saying, we need to encourage university graduates to study this and to take this seriously. There needs to be a career progression, uh, a way that motivates you to actually want to learn all those things, to do it professionally, because there's a lot to learn. And then I ask this friend of mine, and we're live streaming, this is what makes it best. We're live streaming in this moment, I'm talking about it. And I ask, so what do you think we should, what should this be called? What is this called? And my friend goes, oh, that sounds like a data janitor. Okay. <laughs> how, is this how we're going to motivate our undergraduates to go to university? And they're picking their major, they're deciding what to study, and then they call their parents and they say, I've picked one. I would like to go through a hard, grueling training program to be a data janitor. Are you proud of me, mom and dad? Right? That's not a good start. And it's not a good start when data seems to be everybody else's job. So we have quite a brittle profession here because a lot of it is based on the hope that someone is going to do a job that they didn't train for and that we're almost surely not paying them properly for. Right? We should worry about this. And we should also remember that a lot of the data that we wish we had, or the quality we, that we wish we had it at, won't exist if we have this basic problem of economics. So that's our first thing. Data are not objective. They are subjective. The design matters. And even though we rely so much on data for automation, there's not that good of a plan in the data professions. So data quality is everything. That is the first point I, I really want to hammer home here. And I know a lot of you in the audience think you've heard this all before and you get it. But if you did, wouldn't there be better progress in the industry to motivate, fund, and compensate people whose job the data quality actually is? And then let's talk a little bit about the internet as a data source. Like that is a source of mirrors, isn't it? 
kind of reflects reality a little bit, but you get a skewed perspective. Never forget that the internet is not reality. How you behave online isn't how you behave in your natural surroundings. And we know what kind of stuff lives on the internet in the parts where people can be anonymous, right? It's not necessarily bringing the best of us to anything. So we need to be quite careful with what we allow ourselves to do on the basis of uh, wild type data. Now back to our question of whose job AI automates. Let's look again at the uh, broader category of AI. By the way, I'm using AI and machine learning somewhat interchangeably here because I've given up. Once upon a time, AI used to be the superset, then machine learning was the subset, then at some point machine learning was the superset and AI was the subset, something something, if it's deep learning then it's AI. I give up. Honestly, there was a set of cycles of funding and disappointment where you got the funding if you said AI, and then things didn't work out, so then you started saying something else, machine learning, and then the funding didn't work out there, and so we went up and down in these cycles. I uh, like bell bottoms and skinny jeans, right? Like, it's, it's the fashion of what we're gonna call it. So actually, my favorite definition of the difference between AI and machine learning is if it is written in Python, it's probably machine learning, and if it's written in PowerPoint, it's probably AI. Yeah. So, I'm using them interchangeably, the hell with it. So whose job does AI automate? Let's look carefully at what this is as an automation proposition. When I'm automating the traditional way, first, I have to know how to do the task so that I can explain to you what precisely you need to do with each input to get the output. Second, I have to think about every little instruction and then I have to write it down and first, I can write it down for myself in pseudocode or, you know, English or whatever language I speak. And then I have to translate it into something the computer can understand. But I have to deal with every single line. And maybe it takes 10,000 lines, maybe it takes 100,000 lines of code to automate my task. I gotta write each one down. And you might be saying, oh no, maybe it's, um, maybe I just get a package somewhere, I, you know, find some library, I install something, and then I just pull from there and I don't have to write the code by hand myself, sure. But some member of our species had to do it. So some human is responsible for having thought through all those instructions. Whereas with machine learning and AI, there are just two lines. Optimize this goal on that data set, go. Now, those of you who raised your hand for AI professional, you know there's a lot more code that you're writing. But that is because the tools are nasty. At the core, there are only these two lines of instructions. What does success look like? What data should we point this pattern finding thingy at? And off we go. And really, if you had the ability to brute force it because you had enough computing power, you could try every known algorithm with every permutation of it pretty much, quickly eliminate some, try everything out, subject to just the two important lines of instruction, optimize this goal on that data set. And as the tools become easier and easier, we will strip away all the huffing and puffing and the difficulty of forcing a data set in this format to be taken up by an algorithm uh, that was designed over there. You know, it's, some of these tools are, are really, it, only a mother could love them. And you're left with just these two lines, which means that almost anyone then will be able to automate a task. Huh. What do we see here? First, two very subjective lines. What is the goal of the system? What does success look like? Why am I building this pet classifier that does cat not cat? And why should tiger be labeled cat versus not cat? Or vice versa? There's no one single right way to do that. What about scoring mistakes? That's all part of how we're gonna um, express our goal, which mistakes are worse than which other mistakes, again, highly subjective. And then which data set, which textbook shall we learn from? 
There are a lot of different textbook choices you could use. You could also edit and modify and get different versions of the textbooks. And all of this is highly subjective. But now available, just two lines and you can automate your task. How wonderful and how terrifying simultaneously. This is both the peril and the promise of AI. The promise is if I'm doing a little task myself, I can now automate it very quickly. How great for me. I don't have to go and write everything from scratch. But at the same time, what if I am automating something on behalf of millions or billions of people? What if my code's going to touch a lot of lives? Well, then I can, again, without thinking too hard about it, get it automated. So we have a thoughtlessness enabler here. We can be more thoughtless and we can automate thoughtlessly, which is great when it only affects you. But when we start scaling that up, we can do damage. This is like a proliferation of magic lamps, lamps with genies. And knowing how to make a wish responsibly is a very important skill. It's the skill of decision leadership. We're not even talking about this, though. We're not asking ourselves, who is it who has the skills on our team to figure out what success should look like? How do we carefully state what we're looking for? What do we actually want to create in the world? And what would be the consequences if we got what we asked for? And which data is appropriate and why? And what would need to be true about that data for us to want to use it? Very, very subjective questions that very few people are trained to answer. So you should worry. Who is actually being tasked with doing this for massive systems? Do they have the skills to do it? And as you see the tools get easier and easier, you'll see a shift from a focus on huffing and puffing and actually getting the data to be taken up by the algorithm and then deployed to production, and a lot more focus on how do we put 10,000 lines or 100,000 lines of thought back into these two lines. We've allowed ourselves to be thoughtless, but on some things that's not okay. So how do we put that thought back in? How do we very carefully design systems that can affect society at scale? But back to the question of whose job are we actually automating here? Well, it is the developer's job. Right? It, we're going from having to write instructions to now being able to say, instead of knowing how to do the task, here's the objective, here's the data, go. That said, it's not like we're putting software developers out of business. First, there's still a lot of huffing and puffing to do to get the uh, algorithms to accept those instructions and the data. Um, second, we are actually unlocking a whole class of new applications. And all the old approaches are still going to be very economically necessary. Why? If you are able to automate your task with instructions, that is how you should do it. That's how you get the most control. If you're able to say what needs to be done in what order, and you give those instructions to your machine or to your human employee, you can be sure of what that person's going to do next if they're following the instructions. Exactly what you've told them to do. No guessing. No surprise ways that they interpreted anything. Just follow those instructions. Whereas, if you know how to give the instructions, but instead you give a few examples, who knows what they're going to learn in those examples? Right? Good luck to you. Maybe they'll learn the right thing. Maybe they won't. And mistakes are possible. That's true with humans. That's also true with these AI systems. So why are we using them? To automate things we can't automate the other way. So we're not putting developers out of business. Everything developers used to do and used to be able to do, you're still going to want to do that the old traditional way. But now we've got a whole new class of applications. And let's talk about a new, new class of applications. The two different AIs. So this year, we're talking a lot about AI. We tend 
when we find ourselves hanging out with friends and having a glass of wine and talking about all these new things in AI in 2023, we tend to be talking about generative AI. So let's remind ourselves very quickly of the difference. So discriminative AI, the old one, the one you're used to from uh, last decade, that is all about applying a label. So this is a thing labeler. We had the cat not cat example of that. Here's another classic, uh, again, with vision. So I really like this tweet. It comes from BJ May, who complained that he was locked out because his smart uh, front door lock, his, his Nest camera system, locked him out because it was protecting him from Batman, right? It didn't want to let Batman in the house, so it locked poor BJ May out. So it's supposed to find the right answer. It doesn't always work correctly, right? These systems do make mistakes. And it's really important for designers to remember this, because imagine what would have happened to poor BJ May if there wasn't a plan for mistakes. He wouldn't have gotten back into his house. Instead, he can put, use a pin to, to get himself in because the engineers built that safety net and knew that mistakes were possible. So that's thing labelers. On the other hand, generative AI is about creating a plausible exemplar. What are we learning? Not a label, but a distribution. And what can you do with a distribution is create a really good fake. So this is a fake maker. So as you all know, Picasso is very famous for his paintings of laptops. So I have some examples for you there in the uh, top right hand corner. This is where I'm using an image generation tool called Midjourney. Uh, Midjourney is my favorite casino. I really enjoy playing with Midjourney. It gives you, you put in a prompt, it gives you um, four options back, and maybe you like it, maybe you rerun the prompt until you get something that you like. Uh, I've also created some fake Gucci sunglasses for you. So both of these aren't, you know, it's not a real Picasso. This doesn't really uh, exist out there. We are generating from a distribution of plausible Picasso type and laptop type things uh, to get this lovely fake for you. So it's a game of plausible exemplars. And people ask a question that bugs me so much when they see this stuff. They ask, can AI be creative? Does this mean that AI is the artist? Is AI making art? And then I have to remind folks of an entire century of art history. Because if you're asking questions like this, you must have missed something from art history from the 20th century. So let's go back to 1917. Marcel Duchamp found this iconic piece. This is considered iconic in the art world. It's a urinal. He signed some name on it, not even his own name. He took it to the exhibition and went, that's art. And it was. We consider this a very interesting piece. It's worth a lot. Is it art? Sure. Why? Because art is a conversation that humanity is having with itself and has been having for millennia. And to make art, you are trying to have the next word or the next sentence in this grand conversation. But who is the artist? I would say Duchamp. Let's give him credit. Because otherwise, where are we going to put the credit? On the Porcelain makers, the toilet company, that doesn't make any sense to me. And should we penalize him because he didn't sculpt it from scratch, mixing his own materials, creating his own porcelain? Not at all. This cut out a lot of toil and allowed him to say what he wanted to say much faster. Generative AI plays the same role. Like a paintbrush, it's a tool for you to be able to say what you need to say faster and better. And the secret behind a lot of these generative AI art things is that it's very rare that the first one is the one that's presented to the audience. So AI made art that won some art competition. No, that was like the 8,000th iteration. A person cranked the handle on these tools 8,000 times. 500 times, however many times it took to get the one that they were looking for, to express what they wanted to express. So where's the creativity? It's in the human. But the human can go a little bit faster. They don't need to mix paints. We don't penalize artists today for not mixing their own paints the way that they would have in the Middle Ages. 
making their own paintbrushes out of horsehair or whatever it is. You go to the shop, you buy some paintbrushes, you buy some paint, and you go paint. That's great. That lets us get there faster. And that's what generative AI allows you to do as well. What are some other things you can do? So good old open AI uh, all over the news. It's open chat GPT. I have in audiences like this, I have asked who here has never used chat GPT. And so I'm going to stop embarrassing audiences because there does tend to be one hand. And then I ask, okay, who here has never read about chat GPT? And the no hands go up. And I think, what a strange equation. It is faster to try it than to read about it. So why did my one, hand, one or two hands read about it without trying it? You may as well just try it. The interface is super easy. It's like sending a text message and you type whatever you want to type. Uh, this is when we asked CEOs what they personally use ChatGPT for the most. One of the favorite answers was to write a retirement poem or a birthday poem. So, uh, you know, it's, it's really getting used for its, um, its top applications. But here I've asked it to write a funny retirement poem for your CEO in the style of Dr. Seuss. And what does it give us back? You've been the big cheese, the head of the pack. Now it's your time to kick back and slack. Right? So, uh, d definitely the highest in... Um, what we could possibly want out of our technology. Let's try another one. This is a, a, an application that OpenAI found and noticed was a statement, perhaps, about the human condition. So a lot of people like to take bullet points and then ask OpenAI, uh, ChatGPT, to turn that into an email, a full email. So here are some summaries, expand that out into an email. And what OpenAI found was that this was a popular use case, as was this other use case, which was summarize this email as bullet points back into the original. So I think that, that uh, does tell us something a little bit uh, sad and funny about how humans work. And wouldn't it be great if all of our emails could just be bullet points in the first place? But what we're seeing here with generative AI is a new kind of user interaction. It is AI as a raw material. AI, for AI's sake, given to you, the user, to do anything you want with next. So we have the ability to find the right distributions, to pull laptops by Picasso out, or Gucci sunglasses, or whatever else you want. But now we're giving you the tool you figure out what you want to shape it into. And when we talk about regulating generative AI, I hope you can appreciate now how hard this is. Because we are not good at regulating raw materials, even physical raw materials. Whose fault is it? If I invent a phenomenal anti-gravity material, that could be pretty cool for humanity. But some idiot's going to make skis out of it. So whose fault is it then when they go and ski in anti-gravity skis and hurt themselves? Was it me for making the material? Was it whoever helped them fashion the skis? Or was it then the user of those skis? Who is responsible? How do we limit what the uses of it are that would be okay versus not okay? This is a hard problem. Hard with physical materials when it comes to digital raw materials. Good luck really hard to figure out how to regulate. And when I hear that a problem is really hard, the last thing that I want is for us then to solve it in some dumb way just to say we've solved it so we can move on in our to-do list. Solving AI regulation here is difficult, which means that maybe we shouldn't get ahead of ourselves and make a bunch of laws we haven't thought through. Maybe go slowly and think about the consequences of regulating, maybe request a bunch of information that would help you regulate it later. So it is a very, very difficult problem. Then another kind of application is all kinds of translation type stuff. So here I have asked it to write the Fortran code for generating the Fibonacci sequence. And I do not speak or understand Fortran, so hopefully someone in the room can look at this and see if it's right or not. What I can do is I know what the Fibonacci sequence is and I can write out those instructions. I could also have written them out the way that I want and ask for it to translate that to Fortran. But here's a little quick bit of trouble. Anyone here going to fess up 
going to confess with me that you don't speak Fortran. Anybody? Right, so I'm seeing some hands. So imagine that we asked for this lovely Fortran code for generating the Fibonacci sequence, and we get it. Do we take this and plug this directly into our code base? when we don't understand what the hell it is. <laughs> Terrifying. So with this one, okay, maybe we, have, we know how to be software engineers. I would figure out how to make some unit tests here. Maybe I would line by line try to figure out what I'm looking at. But you can see the more code that I generate with this in languages that I don't speak or understand, the more space I'm leaving for potentially catastrophic disasters as I plug this in to an already complicated system. This is why people are saying that good developers are becoming much better. The estimates coming from McKinsey of 50% better. If you're a good engineer, then this can cut out a lot of drudgery. But bad engineers are becoming worse. And bad teams are reducing corporate productivity because they're plugging all kinds of nonsense into their systems. So in general here, people who are already highly productive are making themselves more productive. They understand the output, they understand how to put it together into solutions. But those who are on the less productive side or they don't know what they're working with or they just believe AI is magic and they plug things in where they shouldn't, they are reducing everybody's productivity. So that's, that's a point worth thinking about. And I'm, I wonder if it would surprise anybody here that I do not, in fact, speak Serbian. So imagine if I had a really, really important email that I needed to write to someone in Serbian where I really care about my reputation and that relationship. So I just go straight to OpenAI. I ask for that email to be translated. I get something out of there and phew, I send it. What a disaster that could be. Like maybe it's correct. But if I have no way of checking it, I'm going to have problems. And this brings us to why it's so difficult to scale generative AI in the enterprise. To use it for personal productivity and to make an individual responsible for the output is quite an easy one if you already have a smart and productive person. But when you think about taking the person out of the loop, and then at scale, automating some processes. Remember, these systems do make mistakes. It may be hard for humans to check. It may be hard to even define whether that output was right or not. So how do you set up at scale this kind of automation? From now on, we're automatically going to write all our emails in Serbian with this system. Well, you're gonna, you're gonna have to test the hell out of it. And that's what a lot of companies don't know how to do. So no wonder we're getting this bottleneck in enterprise automation. And so when should you trust an AI system? There are two paths to trust, the human in the loop model. So make the human individually responsible and treat that as individual productivity increases or a hell of a lot of safety testing and safety nets. And as always, it is safest to have both. We're still so excited in what you potentially could do that we end up in organizations with death by a thousand pilots, we get mandates from the top saying, everybody go find two, three use cases and everybody go try plug this into your business and then take the human out of the loop too. They don't know how to do testing though. They don't know how to build the safety nets. They've removed the human in the loop and then they wonder why their use cases don't work. I do think that we're gonna have a lot more generative AI at scale, but this is the part to figure out. In fact, I'm a recovering statistician and uh, recovering also because we are the grumpiest of the data scientists and we've sort of been folded into the data science profession for a bit, definitively the, um, you know, less popular sibling in that family for now. And I cackle to myself slightly <laughs> because statisticians are going to have to be back, aren't they? Someone's going to have to figure out, does this thing in fact work? 
the way that we think it works. Someone's going to have to figure out the testing. Testing is still the most difficult part, especially in generative AI. And here is a little analogy that I encourage folks who are not in this business to really internalize. The data are like the ingredients. The algorithms are like appliances in a kitchen. When we were talking about doing applied AI last decade, we were talking about innovating in models, in recipes. So creating a croissant that is sugar-free and gluten-free and dairy-free and delicious. How do you go about making a recipe like that? You get a bunch of ingredients, you get the appliances, and then you tinker, you dabble, you play, you hope. You do a bunch of taste testing, you get your croissant or cookie or whatever it is, you start being able to produce them at scale, how wonderful. Now, with the generative AI revolution, it's equivalent to saying instead of I give all of you the cookie that I've made and you can eat it or not eat it right here, right now, and you don't have to worry about where it comes from. Instead, I'm saying, here, get access to my cookie maker, the cookies, and take them and turn them into whatever you want. Anything creative, Valentine's Day, baskets, spray painted gold, call it art, whatever you want to do. But you see that we do lose an interesting layer of control there because we have a separation in this system from whatever the dish was to however you're going to use it. And the users down the line of these products, you are not told very much about where those ingredients came from, how they got processed, what their quality was, what were those appliances, what even went on in that kitchen. Is it poisonous, isn't it? Well, you're going to have to test everything yourself again from scratch if you're a downstream user trying to do this at enterprise scale for tasks that matter. For some tasks, though, truly, take a thing, spray paint it gold, what do you care what the ingredients were? It looks about right, now it's gold and it still looks about right, everything's good. But where the ingredients might have mattered, where the quality might have mattered, it's up to you to figure out the testing. And finally, leaving you with the thought of whose job AI will automate as a consequence. Yes, it is about engineering and automation, but as a consequence of these technologies, what are we gonna see? In the US, what we are seeing is the second quartile um, taking the most, having the most effect, taking the most economic damage from these technologies. The second quartile, of skill level and income. And this is puzzling economists. Why not the people at the very bottom, the least skilled labor? And why not the most skilled labor? Well, I have a guess. What's happening in the second quartile is the tasks that are most repetitive and most digitized. If it's repetitive and digitized, if it's copy pasting, if it's doing things on mental screensaver with a computer, those are the tasks that are most likely to be uh, rendered no longer necessary for humans to do. Whereas the difficult skills of having taste, of being creative, of thinking, of problem solving, of being a great engineer, those skills and those jobs are still extremely important, no matter how good your tools get. But there is a small economic issue here, which could become a very big one. What we take for granted is how our young people become our senior trusted leaders, artists, developers, managers, etc. Nobody trusts someone fresh out of university, right? I, I don't know, do you? So what, is, what does that path look like from newly graduated to senior and trusted? Often, a bunch of easy to measure output that's pretty repetitive, a bit mindless. You understand the person's character by working with them. You see if they go a little outside the box, but mostly you give them very low trust tasks. Exactly the kind of tasks that are gonna get automated here. And what you will see is that bosses, leaders, are now going to absorb a lot of the work that their junior staff members would have done. Great, in the short term. How are you gonna get the next generation of bosses, though? 
what is your plan for developing your talent to a point where you can trust them? Because the skills that are most likely to get left are those skills where you need to apply some taste, where you need to be trusted, where you need to have judgment and good sense and expertise. And where, when you look at the code, or you look at the output, or you look at the art, you are able to judge whether that's what you're looking for. Right? If I never learn how to speak Serbian, how am I going to deal with that email output in Serbian? How are we going to incentivize me to learn the language? Whether it's a programming one or a human one, to get to the point where I'm able to supervise the functioning of these systems rather than do the task myself. This is a big piece that is missing in our economic plans globally. And so as you, if you are beginning to automate with these systems in your organizations, as you're taking responsibility for this, please pay attention to the three big topics from this talk. One, data quality matters, and today it's nobody's job. That's a problem. Two, testing these things is difficult, especially when we're talking about generative AI at scale without humans in the loop. And three, it's going to be up to you to create that plan for how you're going to be able to train your staff and not leave anyone out. Because your most valued staff members, the ones you really do want to have around, often need that path of going through a gauntlet that these tools uh, may render le uh, less attractive in the short term. And that's why we have a term like secret cyborgs in America, so people who want to use these tools, they don't want their managers to know. That should be a warning. It should be a warning that we don't trust managers to handle that transition fairly, carefully, and responsibly. And so how do we in this room think about championing a gentle and also effective and intelligent way through the challenges of today to get to a highly productive economy and workforce tomorrow. Thank you very much. Thank you.